Hello, welcome back. And I finally got around to do another video in our Therm series. This time I will show you how to calculate an average U value of a wall that has different components that are not as linear as our first example that we did in the introduction video. At this point, I assume that you have looked and familiarized yourself with Therm. So I will it will be very it will be easier to follow along of what we do because I will not spend a lot of time once we are within the software. Let me introduce the problem first. And we are starting with a very simple shoebox model. And uh, I've sketched this up in SketchUp to give you a better overview of what we're dealing with. So it is a relative simple building. It has um, measuring roughly 40 feet in length, about 25, I think 25 feet in width, and it's 10 foot high. So this is a space that we want to model in terms of our energy losses, of our heat loss that happens through this as an enclosure. What we typically do is use the area that we have for a certain component and multiply it with the conductivity that is given for or actually the conductance of this component and the delta T that exists between the interior and the exterior space. So you have such U values for roofs you, or ceilings in this case, you would find them for walls and um, uh, each wall doesn't have to be necessarily the same as the other. And this is something what we specifically will look at. So in the example that we discussed before, we were looking at a wall system of the simplest form that just consists out of concrete and added XPS insulation on the side. So this would be something like that. But what is actually if our wall system is not as simple as that, that it has just parallel layers, but looks more like a stud wall system. So in the US, we use that quite a bit. And we typically start on the interior side with a gypsum board, roughly half inch gypsum board. And then we build it out with studs. We typically also add fiber insulation between the studs and finish it on the outside with an OSB sheathing board. So this construction now is consisting of different materials in different sections. And we cannot directly usually calculate a U value as an average of that, um, even though there are simplified methods for how you could this actually do. So with that being explained, what we are trying to do now is find an average U value for this wall that we can use in our simplified calculations where we then just multiply with this area and the delta T that exists for this wall. So I have meanwhile started my Therm application. In this case, I'm using Therm version 7.858. This is the current version as of November, 2022. Uh, shouldn't be too much different of what we do here in any other version. And I want to quickly check a few options in the preferences. So first I want to make sure that I am in inches and pound uh, because I'm here in the US and I'm using the BTUs per inch thickness per square foot in Fahrenheit. Um, for my drawing options, I have expanded my drawing size to 50 inches in each direction. And for the snap settings, I made sure that I have my grid selected and to show and the snap to my grid and a snap to each in half inches spacing. That fits very well in my material layers that I described before, because our drywall is half an inch thick, as well as the studs, the lumber that we use follow a half inch grid pattern. So the construction can be separated in two different configurations. One where you go through the studs and have basically a, a fur, a wood material in the area where otherwise a fiberglass cavity is. And in this example, I will actually start with the stud, even though the cavity is the larger area, but it will help us understand of how we 
define the geometry. So first I draw a rectangle. I need to identify my correct material and it should be somewhere a wood, a soft wood. This is usually a pine wood. And I draw my stud here from my origin and a two by four stud is actually not two by four inches in dimension. It's actually one and a half and three and a half. So this is a common convention that may be new for people who are outside the US. And you see here in the bottom um, at the area where the dimensions are, the, the grid is shown. Uh, we have 1.5 and three and a half inches. So this is now my first material. On the inside of this stud, I typically mount gypsum board. And so we need to find our gypsum board. I use the standard material that comes with the architectural library um, that is shipping with Therm. And I start to draw my uh, material, my gypsum board here. It really doesn't matter that it doesn't go out there. I just want to look at what happens when I go through the stud. And so this is just half an inch thick. So on the inside, we have this gypsum board. On the outside, at the same time, we have an OSB sheathing. And an OSB sheathing is not directly available in our material library here. We could obviously define one. But for now, I will just use something that is similar enough, which is a plywood material. And it's a half inch Douglas fir, again, that I will use here. And it's also a half inch thick. Um, there are plywoods in different thicknesses. I just use it with half an inch. If we want to calculate that, we need to define boundary conditions. And this is what we switch to boundary conditions. Everything is adiabatic at the beginning. We want to make the outside and exterior in winter. Doesn't really matter if it would summer, but we have an interior and an exterior boundary condition. At this time, you have the vertical surface. And to not get the warning that we have no U-values tagged, I actually want now to measure my U-value going through the wood. And for that, I would need to define a U-factor tag. The standard tags that you may have may differ from mine. In my library, I already have a few more labels created. I use the You've, it's not really a library, it's just a list of tags. And I want to add a new tag and I call it now stud. And we'll use that one just for better identification for this section of my wall. So this is now my stud. And if I calculate everything out and show my U values, you will now see, don't forget we need to go into total length or at least project in the correct direction. So I have now my U value of 0 0.1788 that replicates an R value of close to an R6. So that's so far for the stud wall. Okay, now that we have made that, let's save it as a stud wall or just stud section and start another file. And maybe I just do that first because this is a safe way to have backups. And I save this now as not my stud section, but now my cavity section. And now that we have saved the cavity section in a new file, all I have to do is replace this central material that is currently set to wood and make this a fiberglass insulation, a bat. So this is something careful that you don't use fiberglass. You need to find insulation and fiberglass bed. That's what we can use here. Results need to be recalculated. And now we can look at our U value that went significantly down, 0 0.07. So this um, represents an R value of slightly above 13. And R13 is definitely better than the R6 or R5.6 that we had in the stud area. Now, technically, we could quickly just build an average of those to uh, according to the areas that they occur to. So if we have a 16 on center stud spacing, that would require us to count the areas of 14.5 inches per 
16 inch with an R value of the cavity. And on the stud side, we would use the R value of the studs for the one and a half inches. And that could be done easily in a percentage that I can show as simple math here. Now, if we want to actually do that in one file, we can model that with a simple trick that I will explain as the next step. Well, let me open the, uh, the stud section file again and use this one as a starting point and save it now as a combined stud wall. Combined stud wall file. Why do I combine that? Because usually you can only define one domain in a theorem calculation that is calculated. And I want to show you how we can actually look at two pro problems side by side. So in to do that, we need to put in a filler material in between the two sections that we want to look at. And so I create something that can be relatively thin and I will define a new material for that, that is a super insulator. So I open up my material library and what I will do is I want to create a new material and I call it, I, I usually add something like a plus in front that I find it quickly in the list. So these are my materials and I call it a super insulator. Huh? And what will this material do? It will be something that does not allow any conduction and we cannot set the conductivity directly to zero but zero zero one will be equally as good don't go crazy here because otherwise you will have numerical instabilities and the calculation will not run and in this case i will put this the color white so that it really doesn't have any effect on anything else we can leave the emissivity what it is and just close it out from here uh, so you should find your super insulator now on top or on the bottom, depending on how it's sorted, and apply this to this material. And what I can do now is, let me just move a little bit over here and start my other material, my other construction. And this would be, well, let's make it um, uh, six inches wide. And this is not a super insulator now. On the outside, we had a, I would, a plywood material. Then we used, a, this is our fiberglass. Oh, I should have selected it before. So this is our insulation with using a bat insulation, a fiberglass bat. And then we have another material that we wanted to draw on the inside. And that was my gypsum board and I selected it now before that I can draw it right away. So what we still need to do here is add a few more boundary conditions. Let's switch over back to the boundary conditions. I use my all the ones that I already had that I don't have to define them new. This is another one that is now exterior in winter. So we have the blue line there and this is my interior vertical line similar as the other. What I now want to do here is create a tag, a new one, and I call this tag now cavity. Now for another one, let me close that. So I want to label that as a cavity. So here we measure the cavity material, and here we measure the stud material. I can calculate my results again. And now you can simply ignore what happens in between. What you want to make sure is because there's nothing escaping. Uh, what you want to make sure is that your isolines of equal temperature are indeed perpendicular to this material. And you see, we basically do the same as adiabatic boundary conditions on the outside of the domain. So if we look at U values, I now can look at both at the same time. Let me just switch it to the total length that we have. So it doesn't really matter that one is one and a half inch and the other two and a half inches. Um, so I have the two U values and the two R values. We see it's the same result as we had separately. So this is how I have my two basic results now. And if I want to know what's really going on, then I would have to model a combination of the section. 
So the next step would be now to model an additional separator. Let me just make it two inches wide. So this is again my super insulator um, that I find here on the top. And I will now model my stud wall. So for my stud wall, if there are 16 on center, I have two symmetry axes that I can model because it repeats from there uh, in the same pattern. I can either cut through the center of the stud or I can cut through the center of the cavity. Now, in our case, we will do that 16 on center. And if we subtract the stud width of one and a half, we have 14 and a half for the cavity. Now my grid setting here is actually just to the half inch and not to the quarter inch. So I will cheat a little bit and I will split the 14 inch and a half cavity into a seven inch and seven inch on either side. So this is what we do first. So if I use my chipsum board and I can draw my chipsum board on the inside over and that is now a field of 16 inches wide. We need to zoom a little bit further out. Here we have 16 inches in width, half inch thick. So this is now my interior drywall. The next material that we will build is the cavity insulation. And since my cavity insulation is only 14 and a half inch wide, and I don't want to split it exactly because I don't have a quarter inch grid spacing right now, I will cheat a little bit. So I will make one seven and the other seven and a half inches, seven and a half and three and a half but this should be our cavity insulation. So this is insulation for Everglass bat. Uh, maybe let me draw this stud first. So I want to have my softwood stud and this one is now three and a half times one and a half. And then I have another section with my fiberglass insulation. And so while they are technically not exactly symmetric, obviously I could move this stud over half an inch uh, or a quarter of an inch to make it fully symmetric, but this is not making so much difference. On the outside, we still need to build our OSB. So this is the plywood that we found before. Let's set the new boundary conditions and I leave the ones that we have in place but I make this one now um, selected to an interior vertical surface and I create a new tag that I call now the common one, let's say stud wall, stud wall. Apply it to this inner boundary, this is stud wall. On the exterior, we still need to set the exterior winter condition that we have a temperature gradient. And so calculating the results again. And here now you see the effect that the stud has. There is a little bit more going on in the stud than in the fiberglass insulation. And this bypass is the error that we make if we use only a perpendicular heat flux as we do it when we look at the two separate problems. So while the isotherms show us one version of what's going on, the heat flux direction actually could explain that a little bit better. So we go quickly into calculation, display options, and switch it to flux vectors to see the direction of heat flux. And here you can see while heat flux occurs perpendicular in constructions that do not have any variation across their layers. It is a different story when we go to a stud area. So some of the heat diverts over to the stud and takes this kind of a shortcut of higher conductivity and makes therefore more heat flowing and creates therefore a heat flow that is nonlinear across the width of the construction. So let's look at the results. 
and all of them need to be brought to total length. And in terms of U values, we already see that the stud wall and the cavity wall are differing and the stud wall together is averaging out the areas that the, the different materials participate. We can look at the same at the R value side. In this case, we have an R6, 5.6 in the stud area with an R value of 13.6 in the cavity. And now we have an average R value of 11.87 for our wall system. So this U value is the U value that you, we would plug in now into our heat loss calculation for a stud wall. So if we look at the stud wall that we just simulated in therm from an analytical perspective, we would pull in our results that we got from the simulation and the U values that we read there were for the three different respective areas for a stud, for a cavity and for a stud wall. We can now do a manual hand calculation assuming none of the thermal bridging occurs, but the individual parts participate in the wall. So we would have a cavity for 14 and a half inches and the U factor for this cavity of 0 0.0734. Multiplying that out as the percentage of what this 14 and a half inches participate in the 16 inch and center stud wall. At the same time, we have one and a half stud area and the stud wall has a conductance of 0 0.1789. So we would write one and a half over 16 inch over the conductance for the stud. If we add those two together, we can see that this is slightly different from the actual averaged U value that would occur, which basically just takes in account this additional heat flux that takes a shortcut through the stud. In this case, this is just a percent difference, but the higher the conductivity of a the thermal bridge, the more significant this effect becomes. So I hope this video gave you a quick overview of how you calculate U values, how you can calculate several of them in the same time and make a quick comparison between the results that you obtain in different configurations rather than switching through different files. Stay tuned for the next one. Um, I will try to make another one on thermal bridges. And this is where we need the skills that we have just shown here again.